Literally, you guys, this video is just like an absolute dream come true for me. This is so cool. Like to be able to take the microscopic, the invisible, and to make it visible is so freaking cool. But who is surprised? I am also the girl who has slime mold all over her makeup bag, so. <laughs> That's what we're dealing with here. We're about to get real funky. But first, let's just give ourselves a little refresher of like what we're doing here and what's going on. I am super excited to be partnering with Samsung's Solve for Tomorrow on these two videos. And yes, this is part two of two. So if you haven't seen part one yet, then go and check that out here and watch that first. But I wanna start this one off by saying that a great way to learn about something new or to dive into something new, in this case, microbiology and sampling, is by identifying two Two simple things. One is what's the question or problem that we have? And two, what task are we going to design to see if we can get an answer to that question and learn a bunch of stuff along the way? So I actually had the chance to talk to Beth Heckinger, who works with SFT and has been an actual teacher for many years, and she puts it really nicely. I love doing stuff like this. The first thing that we should do to figure this out is identify the problem. So what is the problem? What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to identify the microbes living in our household. Next, how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna use some of the same techniques and tests used by microbiologists to identify microorganisms like bacteria and fungi based on how they grow, what they look like, and how they behave. So like Beth mentions, we have a ton of ways that we can identify microbes. Like in a proper lab, we have tons of tools in our arsenal like chemical reagents and dyes and genetic tests and super high powered microscopes. But since I'm doing this at home, I'm pretty much just armed with my eyeballs and my phone microscope and my specialized kinds of agar. Which means that mostly we're gonna be talking about something called colony morphology. A colony of bacteria is when a group of individual bacteria have gotten so happy and comfy that they've multiplied enough that you can see like a whole big clump of them with your naked eye. And morphology basically means what that that colony looks like, what characteristics it has. So the size and shape of each of the colonies, as well as color, uh, vertical growth, um, the sort of texture or finish of the colony, whether it's matte, whether it's satiny, whether it's very shiny and wet looking. We're also gonna look at edge of colony. So is it sort of feathered? Is it ruffled? Is it perfectly round? These are all characteristics that are gonna be super helpful for us in identifying what these bacteria are. I wanna start with the kimchi plates, I think, because those were the first to show growth, the first where I could actually see a visible colony really obviously. And that's not surprising because that kimchi had live cultures in it as like part of the food, right? So I would be like very concerned that if it didn't have anything growing. So here on this plate, we have some, oh man, I just love looking at these. I find it so satisfying so like, in terms of colony size, clustering, color, and shape, uh, all very, very similar. Now we have a little bit of a hint here because we already know that kimchi is a fermented food that contains a kind of bacteria called lactic acid bacteria. They munch on glucose, which is found in the plant matter of whatever the kimchi is made of. In this case, it was cabbage. And then they release lactic acid and depending on the species, also CO2 and ethanol. That CO2 is what makes fermented foods like kimchi so bubbly, kind of like a carbonated beverage. And as we can see here on our plate, our colonies are a creamy white color and they're round in form with a nice regular margin, which means that they're like round and smooth all the way around. And they're ever so slightly elevated off the surface of the agar, kind of like a little bubble. And it kind of looks like those guys around the edge of the plate might be different because they're a little more transparent, they're a little glossier, and they have a softer, less well-defined edge. But it could also be that these are the same organism, but they're just at a different stage in their colony development. So, not sure. Again, if I were in the lab, I would be able to be running different kinds of tests to see what these bacteria are able to eat, what color they stain with different kinds of dyes, and then what also kills these bacteria to help me identify exactly what these are, like right down to the species. And if I were able to look at them under a high powered enough microscope, we'd also be able to see the cell morphology. So what individual bacteria look like, not just in their colony form. And if these species are lactobacillus, and I'm willing to bet that they are, they'd look probably like one of these guys. Oh 
overall, I'm gonna rate this one seven out of 10 for nice, predictable, reliable, little blippy guys who are good for your digestion. We always like that. Next up, we have our kimchi sample on our McConkie agar, which we explained a little bit in part one, but let's go even deeper here. So this cute pink plate contains compounds that are going to only allow certain kinds of bacteria called gram negative bacteria to grow. And Beth is gonna tell us a little bit more about what that actually means. The big difference between the gram positive bacteria is that they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, whereas gram negative bacteria have a much thinner layer. Fun fact, humans do not have peptidoglycan in any of our cell structures. That's one reason antibiotic compounds that affect peptidoglycan can burst and kill bacterial cells, but don't do any direct harm to human cells. So along with the shape of the bacterial cells, Marin can use something called a gram stain to help her identify what the bacteria are. A gram stain uses a special purple dye that sticks to the thick layer of peptidoglycan in a, a gram-positive cell wall, but not a gram-negative cell wall. Our helpful McConkie plates do a little bit of that work for us because only gram-negative bacteria will grow on this agar. So if bacteria grow on the McConkie plate, we know it's gram-negative. So you can see here on our McConkie plate for our kimchi, we don't have a ton of growth, and that is actually a really good thing. Gram-negative bacteria that are likely to be found in food are likely to be what we call enteropathogens, which means they release toxins when they make their way into our digestive systems that can make us really sick. And some of the most common gram-negative bacteria that you've probably heard of in this context are kinds of E. coli and salmonella species. And these would probably show up as like pearly, whitish, blobby, wet-looking circular raised colonies or pinky versions of that on McConkie agar. And that is not what we've got here. And in fact, if I had to hazard a guess, which is what we're doing here, I would say that what we have here is probably fungal infiltration or contamination of some kind. So I'm gonna give this one one out of 10 for interestingness, but one point for the fact that the bad guys didn't show up, which is nice. And lastly, for our kimchi sample, we have our fungal plates. So this kind of agar kills off bacteria and allows other microbes to have free reign. So in this case, we've got yeasty boys. Look at these amazing colony shapes. I mean, that almost looks like a Fibonacci sequence. That is amazing. Again, I think most of the orange color here is from the kimchi itself. It's sort of that pigment that's left over from like the chili powder in the kimchi. You can see here that there's this kind of like spreading film between larger colonies here, and that is because this particular kind of yeast may be filamentous, or basically they have these little arms reaching out to search for nutrients. It's like microbe grabby hands. And based on environmental conditions, like how hot it is, how crowded it is, how far along they are in their colony development, the colonies will take on different, exciting, very cool to look at morphologies, which is what we can see here. This one is for sure one of my favorite plates. So I'm gonna give it a super high score, nine out of 10 for beauty. Grace, it's cool as outer space, it's yeast. Actually, fun fact, yeast are technically in kingdom fungi, but they're pretty different from most other fungi and molds, like, you know, mushrooms that you would see in the woods. And they are what help us brew beer and bake bread, and they're here on our kimchi too. And in the right dose and of the right species, yeast are not harmful to us at all, depending on where they are in our bodies. Okay, let's move on to our hands. Wow, we have got some vibrant colors showing up today here. Okay, so these little vibrant yellow guys could be a micrococcus species. This kind of bacteria live pretty much everywhere, like water, food, soil, dust, our skin. They're like up for anything and they just kind of hang out having a good time unless something goes wrong. Like if your immune system stops functioning properly, then they can actually cause a pretty nasty skin infection, which is very sneaky of them. Microbes like this that cause disease when given the opportunity are called opportunistic pathogens. And the same goes for these white blobs that we see here. Because we found these on our skin, these are highly likely to be a kind of staphylococcus bacteria, which you've probably heard of commonly referred to as staph. And these orange guys could be any number of bacteria that present like this. Like there are a ton that look like this, but given the context that this was taken from my hand, I would guess that these could be staph 
aureus specifically. Staph aureus is super common on our skin and it isn't necessarily problematic, like just inherently, but it does tend to cause quite a bit of skin infection. If you rough up your skin in that area or if your skin flora gets out of balance for some reason, Staph aureus is particularly common in places that are sort of warm and damp, like creases, uh, armpits, groin, places like that. What's kind of concerning to me is there's less colony growth on the pre-wash plate than there is on the post-wash plate, right? We should see a reduction in microbes after washing our hands, but not so much. This can actually be for a number of reasons. So after I wash my hands, I may not have dried them all the way. And so my sample from my post-wash hands may have been moister, so I may have picked up more bacteria even if there were less on my hands after washing. I also did dry off my hands with the paper towel. My paper towel is just sitting out on my kitchen counter. Uh, so I could have picked up a lot of microbes on my hands after washing from my paper towel. And then also, and this one might play into both of those other variables is that when I washed my hands this day, we had actually been running low on soap. And so I had put water into our soap dispenser with that little bit of soap at the bottom. So our soap was more diluted. It had less actual micelles in it that would help wash away these microbes than full strength soap would. So that could have played a role in why these plates ended up the way they did. I like these plates, these are cool. I'm gonna give it a five out of 10 for nice presentation and vibrancy, if a little unoriginal, which to be fair, in the case of these samples being from my hands, it feels like a good thing. <laughs> Editing Marin popping in here to say that if I really wanted to be diligent about separating out which colonies were which, I would do something called inoculation. That's where I would take a little inoculation loop and I would scoop up one particular colony and put it on an agar plate of its own. Of course, while noting what it was and what its colony morphology was on the mixed bacteria plate and what the original sample was, of course, doing all of my nice labeling and note taking. And then it would grow in isolation from the rest of the bacteria and we could see kind of how all of the different colony morphologies present for this one sample of one particular bacteria and it might help us out a little bit as we go about our identification. Now unsurprisingly our phone samples actually look pretty similar to our hand samples because my phone is in my hand more often than not which I'm kind of ashamed to say. We do have a few more instances here of what are most likely a kind of fungus. That's that little black nodule in the middle of the more transparent skirt. Fungi are more likely to present in a heterogeneous colony, as in the colony doesn't all look exactly the same because fungi, for the most part, can differentiate themselves a little more. And I'll get back into that a little bit later to tell you what I mean, but I'd have to say, our phones are probably a five out of 10. Points docked for copying our hand plates, but points added back for adding at least a little flair of their own. So back to this funky little colony. The reason I think it's a fungus is because it kind of looks like this guy. It has vaguely the same characteristics. This is an Aspergillus, which is a kind of environmental fungus that is found all over the place. But if it gets out of whack or it finds a handy spot on your body, Aspergillus is the same kind of fungus that can cause issues like athlete's foot. So this sample from our shower floor is serving us. It is going all out with this fuzzy look. And the reason that these different kinds of fungi look so fluffy like this is because of what I was talking about earlier. They can differentiate their bodies into sort of like a, an, a core mass and then those fluffy bits are actually their spores or their way of reproducing, kind of like dandelions get fluffy to spread their seeds all around. It's a little bit like that. And it looks like we've actually got several different kinds of fungus here, which are all oh, happily crawling around on my shower floor, apparently. Now, when they get into their sporing shapes like this, this fuzzy stage, they can actually cause people allergies and would be pretty bad to like inhale directly. So we're not gonna do that, but for the most part, relatively harmless unless they get somewhere they're not supposed to. Overall, I'm gonna give this plate like a 12 out of 10 for sheer effort and overkill. I am loving it. This shower plate here too, I love these guys. The color, the 
texture of the tufts. Like, I don't know, I just want that as a painting or something. They're not actually slime molds because if they were slime molds, they'd be sending out way more thread-like tendrils. And slime molds actually aren't a bacteria or a fungus or a yeast or anything like that. They are an amoeba. And I have a whole video on it that you should watch here because they are absolutely insane and probably like my favorite organism of all time. And before we get all freaked out about this, I wanna reemphasize that the reason that we're seeing this visible growth in this way is because we've put our samples on agar. The reason you don't see colonies like this, for the most part, in the places that we've sampled them from is because they're having to compete with all of these other bacteria for space and nutrients and everything that they need to grow. So when we give them all of that on our agar plates, obviously they're gonna flourish and we're gonna be able to see them with our naked eye. So while this is a representative sample of what they would look like if they were growing, this kind of growth is not gonna happen on your shower floor in your house. At least we hope so. I also really wanna make very clear that although I call myself an actual microbiologist at the beginning of both of these videos about microbes, I am still a microbiologist in training. So I do not claim to be the be all end all subject matter expert in this area. And these are just my best educated guesses. I would be willing to bet that many of them are wrong, but it's been really, really fun to look at the colonies and just have that invisible world made visible to us and use the tools we have at our disposal to kind of see what we can narrow down. A big takeaway from this video, I hope is that colony more morphology, while really fun and a super important part of identification, is not a definitive way to identify an organism, especially all the way down to the species. We only had a limited number of kinds of agar for our tests. We only had three different kinds. In reality, there are many, many, many kinds of agar that you can use to help you identify bacteria and lots of different chemical tests and, of course, genetic tests and a higher powered microscope that would help us be able to identify these more definitively. But also, I think something to keep in mind for all all of these plates is that any of these bacteria or fungi could be harmful or cause a problem in a certain place or in a certain abundance. So if they get somewhere they're not supposed to be on or inside your body or in your house or on your food, they could cause some problems. But if they're just existing out in the world in a balanced ecosystem with other microbes or if they're in the place on your body where they usually occur, then they're just chilling. They're just hanging out. But any kind of imbalance can sort of skew towards a little more of a dangerous situation. So it's really a case of location, 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 and what kind of situation that bacteria finds itself in. So for that exact reason, understanding what they are and how they behave when they're where they're supposed to be and when they're not is really important. Hey, it's me, I'm still editing. You may have noticed that I did not include all of the plates in this video, and that's because if I did, this would be hours long. And while I'm sure we would all be very interested in that, I'm gonna let those of you who are really interested in that find those clips on my Patreon. I'll just be posting the clips of what those plates look like, along with the labels of where they are from, what samples they are. So you can go ahead and check that out at the link down in the description box. And I really hope you enjoyed getting more acquainted with your microbial world. Subscribe for more awesome science videos like this soon. And just a quick reminder here at the Again, that this video and the previous one, which you should go watch if you haven't already, are sponsored by Samsung's Solve for Tomorrow competition. You can check them out and what they're all about at Solve for Tomorrow on Instagram and Facebook at samsung.com slash Solve for Tomorrow, or you can also watch my docu-series all about Solve for Tomorrow by clicking here. Also, I filmed this clip and many others in this video and the previous one on my Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra, so that's pretty cool. Thanks, Samsung. Let me know what your favorite plate was down in the comments below. Give me your best ratings for each of the plates. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you next time.